Hey, well, welcome everybody to, uh, to I'd say, maybe our 10th or 12th speaker series. Um, a lot of great uh, friends in the audience today, a lot of new people. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful turnout. And, you know, we always pride ourselves in, um, in having a time ahead of the program to be able to connect, to be able to network, do business, uh, reconnect with old friends, and, and make some new ones. So, uh, so it's, it's always a very, very important part of our program. So um, we, have, uh, we have an amazing panel today. We're going to talk about oysters, which we love to eat, uh, but we also love to grow. And uh, you know, like I said, we have growers here. We have constituents from the boating industry, we have, we, and we have uh, scientists to, to talk about the topic today. So I wanted to first introduce, um, I'm going to introduce Robin. Robin? Silvestri is our executive. My name is Todd Shaw. I'm president of the organization. And before I introduce Robin, please, if we could all have a round of applause for the lessons for today and this sponsorship. Unbelievable. Really amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so Robin Silvestri. Robin Silvestri is our executive director. I'm sure everybody knows Robin, but if you don't, uh, she is the glue that holds us all together. And she's going to be here just to introduce uh, our panel and uh, some of our distinguished visitors. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. My name is Robin Silvestri. And I'm the executive director at Save the Great South Bay. It's a, my great honor to, to work with everybody at this organization. It is a volunteer-driven organization, and, um, and we get a lot done on a volunteer basis. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I joined the organization uh, about six years ago when, um, when I realized I was looking for something that had a mission and a purpose. I'm a boater, I am a, a paddleboarder, a kayaker. We've, I've spent the last 20 years out on the Great South Bay and uh, it's really important to me and my family. And so joining this effort was, uh, was very near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I would like to start off by thanking um, our board members who are um, here with us today. They really spend a lot of their time, donated their time to help this organization run. So I'll start off with Todd, he's our president of the board, uh, Rihanna Quinrati, we have Tom Kane, uh, Karen Marvin, thank you Karen, Wayne Horsley, and Andy Michelle, our uh, board members who are, are present. And of course, our newest board member, James Birch. Thank you all to our board for, our, for all their service to the organization. Uh, I'd like to also thank the, um, um, the public officials who come out and help support our work. Uh, we can't do things in a silo. We are all about collaboration and working with partner organizations, um, local civic associations, and of course a big part of that is our public officials. They drive the policy that helps Long Island develop. Uh, we, we do live on an island and it's a very unique way of life that we, that we must protect and our waterways are, uh, and our drinking water are a big part of that. So I'd like to say thank you to uh, Lindsay who's here representing uh, Congressman Andrew Garbarino. Thank you, Lindsay, for joining us. Uh, Joe Keyes from the village of Patchogue. Uh, Mayor Siri from the village of Amityville. Uh, Mayor Siri also serves as our Amityville Creek Defender. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. Um, we have uh, Ginny Fields from the Islip Town Environmental Council. Uh, Legislator Picarillo, who is a big supporter of our events. Thank you, Legislator, for joining us today. Uh, we have um, Guy Kala representing the Suffolk County Legislator, Kevin McCaffrey, the presiding officer's office, and uh, Councilman Guadron from the town of Islip, and Bill Doyle representing uh, the New York State Senate. So as you can see, there is, a, there is a huge representation of our local public officials. They understand the need to protect the water quality, to protect our way of life here on Long Island. I know... Um, Todd has already said thank you very much to the Lessings Hospitality for their sponsorship. We have a second sponsor, um, the New York League of Conservation Voters, who are out there promoting um, the public, public policy and, um, 
and legislature to protect water quality and our environment as a whole. So I'd like to give a round of applause to them. I'd like to also, you know, there are a lot of people out here in the audience who help us, um, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but I'd like to thank our Creek Defenders. Creek Defender is one of our primary programs where we go out. If you didn't see the map when you walked in, there are 50 creeks that lead into the Great South Bay from between Massapequa and Mastic Beach. And these creeks serve as the arteries to the bay, bringing fresh water down. Uh, we have, these creeks span 16 towns and villages, and in each of these towns and villages, we have an appointed creek defender. Again, a volunteer uh, whose roots are deep in the community. Um, they are, they spend a, a lot of time, but they are very passionate about protecting their local creeks. Uh, their season really is in March and April, and we have about two dozen cleanups, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, that are coming up. There's a, a poster up at the front, they're very easy to come out, spend an hour and a half. Uh, we'll get between 50 and 100 people at these cleanups, and they really can make an impact in removing debris and things that are blocking um, the free flow of our creeks. So I'd like to say thank you to uh, Walt Meschenberg, who is our Mastic Beach Creek Defender, uh, James Birch, who is our Sable Creek Defender, Ron Gibbons, who has recently come on as our Great River Creek Defender, Andy Merchelle, who sits, uh, plays many roles here at the organization, <laughs> but is also our longstanding West Islip Creek Defender, and Todd Shaw, who serves as our Babylon Creek Defender. If I missed you as a Creek Defender, please raise your hand. Oh, um, who do we have back there? Oh, Dave Schrader. Oh, Dave, out there protecting the Naguntatag, uh, the Naguntatag in Lindenhurst. Thanks for joining us, Dave. And uh, did I say Tom Keane? Uh, okay, yeah, we have Bayshore in the house. And I'd like to mention Ed Reagan, who runs our Day in the Life program. It's a, it's a portion of our Creek Defender program where we bring students out onto the rivers and the creeks to conduct, conduct a, a five module water quality testing. It's our way to get the, um, to generate the, the next generation of local stewardship. I mean, I'm old. This is um, I'm I'll be happy to see uh, improvements in the bay in my in I'd love to see it in my lifetime. I'm more hopeful for my kids' lifetime. Uh, but the next generation of local stewardship is so important for us to cultivate now. Uh, and day in the life of a river starts with that. It helps us get the kids their hands uh, in the mud, uh, their, well, their, their feet in the creeks, and really helps them get to know, get off their phones and get to know the creeks and rivers that they cross over every day. So thank you to all of our Creek Defenders for, for your service. Um, these events are also not possible with a lot of volunteer support. I'd like to thank um, Kelly Zebro, who has just joined us as an administrative assistant. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I have one more Creek Defender to mention, which is Karen. I'm going to ask you to stand up and get a little round of applause for Karen Marvin. <laughs> Karen runs our paddleboard tribe, and she spans all of the creeks. So when we need, uh, um, we need to get deep into the creeks, she'll ga garner a, a tribe of paddleboarders, kayakers, who get out there and load up their boards with trash. She works a lot on Fox Island and uh, in collaboration with Operation Splash. Uh, so, so back to our volunteers, we have um, Joe DeFelice and Peter Judge who are uh, recording this today so that we can post it on our YouTube channel for people who are unable to join us. Um, Peter is also making a documentary on oysters, so um, you are, you are, um, by, by entering here, you actually agreed to be part of the documentary if he films you, um, uh, his, his documentary. Peter, when should we expect your documentary to be, to be released? Okay, sometime in the future. So I'd like to thank um, Kathy Schmitz for coming out today, Patty for helping us set up, uh, Walt and Ed for helping me pull everything together, Tom and Todd helped set up the, the mic and the AV. And as you can see, these are, these are a hugely collaborative effort. Um, so I think that's it for, for volunteers. Um, I also want to say uh, thank you to some of our partners who are here. 
that our programs are not possible without. So out here in the audience, we have Sea uh, Tuck Environmental, who we work with on our oyster project and our upcoming uh, unified water study, which will span from Hempstead to Shinnecock. We have Cornell Cooperative, uh, Save Environmental, uh, the New York State DEC, Wade, thank you for joining us today. We have the South Shore Estuary Reserve, which is one of the governing bodies to help protect um, this, the, the waters from Massapequa to Shinnecock. We have Sally Kellogg with us. Uh, the Town of Islip Shellfish Hatchery, uh, Madeline from Keep Islip Clean. And I think that's it for our partners. So thank you very much to our partners. With that, I'd like to um, introduce our panel of speakers. We have Greg Rivara from Cornell Cooperative. Uh, since 1986, Greg has worked with commercial shellfish farmers in Suffolk and Nassau counties to help with siting and permitting as well as performing research for both uh, commercial and uh, municipal shellfish growers. Aquaculture is, um, is a big deal here. We have 26 acres of shellfish farms, uh, oyster farms right out, uh, right out off Sexton Island. Uh, Greg is a strong supporter of nonprofits, including our own. Uh, and he's very heavily involved with shellfish restoration. He received his bachelor's in marine science from Southampton College and his MS from Stony Brook University. So thank you, Greg, for joining us today. <laughs> Next up, we have Chelsea Miller, Miller representing the New York State uh, DEC. Um, working together with the DEC ensures that we remain in compliance with their regulations. We are uh, about following the rules and making things work within the parameters that are set out to ensure safety for everyone, uh, and not only our the public, but also our marine life. So Chelsea is a biologist who has been with the DEC for the past 10 years, and she joined the Shellfish Management Unit in 2021. She specializes in managing permits for shellfish restoration projects, and is currently involved in the creation of the New York State Shellfish Restoration Plan. Again, this is a collaborative effort to, um, to streamline the permitting process and the procedures for, for setting up sanctuaries around the, around the state. We are, we're very grateful for that work. I'm going to mess it up, Demetrius Carusas. Yeah, All right, great. great. Demetrius Caruso is also from Cornell Cooperative. He's the shellfish restoration manager. He began working for Cornell as a, a flupsy technician. Flupsies are places where, uh, in very simple terms, where you grow out baby oysters. Uh, and he has worked on the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project. He currently operates a research hatchery at Flax Pond Marine Lab and manages the, the aquaculture facility at Gold Star Battalion Beach in Huntington. Uh, Demetrius leads the CCE Oyster Care Program, which is community aquaculture restoration and education. You're going to hear a lot today about community oyster gardening, which is very exciting. Um, and he works with organizations and citizens to, interested in growing shellfish and restoring habitat in their, in their local waters. Uh, then we have uh, Andy Merchel. So I'm going to ad lib here, Andy. Uh, Andy is not only on our board, but he um, has a background in biology and is um, having served in the, um, the, in the retail or commercial world, he's now um, returned to his roots, I will say, in working with the Oyster Project for the Great South Bay. Uh, he has been leading the way for us in, um, in establishing sanctuaries, which I'm sure you'll hear about today, and uh, creating community oyster gardens across, across Long Island, uh, across the South Shore. So I'd like, with that, I'd like to bring Andy up to introduce our, um, introduce Barry, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I've had an interesting career. I did uh, get a good background in marine environmental science at Stony Brook. So uh, we're all well connected through Stony Brook, through Cooperative Extension. Uh, Demetrius, you're not aware of it, but uh, Flax Pond is where I really cut my teeth. I uh, actually supervise the construction of the marine greenhouse out there. So I've, I'm, I love Flax Pond. If you're not familiar with it, it's north of uh, the Stony Brook campus, and it is a pristine uh, 
wetland area that has been used in numerous studies as a baseline, pristine environment. It's really uh, quite remarkable. I haven't been there myself in a, in a long time, but I'd like to get back there soon. Uh, I see numerous people here that I'm familiar with. Jeff Kasner, uh, if, if you don't know who he is, uh, he's been around for quite a long time with the town of Brookhaven. He's uh, got a handle on the history of shell fishing in Great South Bay that uh, I don't know if anybody else could really uh, compare with that, but uh, good, good to see you here, Jeffrey. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I put this panel together I am sitting on this panel not because I put myself here, but because one of our panelists is unable to make it today. So I am uh, quite overwhelmed at uh, the people that are sitting beside me on this panel. Uh, in a very short period of time, I got a lot of experience in uh, growing oysters. And uh, thank you for Barry to uh, introduce me to the gardening program, Demetrius for continuing to support me with that. And uh, Greg, of course, has uh, been holding my hand for uh, the last couple of years with our sputtering sanctuary efforts. Um, that being said, I'll introduce Barry, uh, is now working for Sea Grant. Uh, he's worked in the agriculture industry across New York State and um, along with this work, he's uh, dedicated himself to uh, supporting a sustainable and successful aquaculture industry. Uh, he does have a degree in marine biology from Southampton College and a master's in biology from uh, Long Island University at uh, CW Post. So without further ado, Barry Oodleson, please come on down. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. What a great turnout. This is a great place. Uh, it's a lot nicer than doing it on Zoom like we did last time. Was that two years ago now? Um, yeah, COVID, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I'd like to thank a variety of people and mention a few things. But in the interest of us getting to the fun talking about stuff, I think we're going to jump right in here. Um, I do want to back up and mention, prior to coming to New York Sea Grant last year, I worked for Cornell Cooperative Extension for nine years before then, so very well versed with this group, and Demetrius was actually my successor when I left, uh, New York Sea Grant, uh, left to come to New York Sea Grant last year. Um, so yeah, so I want to start us off, make sure our audience understands some of the regulations involved when it comes to oyster uh, habitat restoration. Um, so first I'm going to let Chelsea talk about um, the various classifications that exist for New York's water bodies. We have three of them regarding shellfish. We've got a certified, which is available for year-round harvest and growing. Um, there's seasonally certified, and then there's uncertified. And it, this can be very confusing to many people that are not intimately involved in this. Um, and it makes things challenging when there's so many great ideas for projects, but then the realization of why it can't be done in certain water bodies. So, Chelsea, can you briefly describe what makes a water body certified versus uncertified? Sure. Um, so I'll start with certified. Uh, these areas are areas where people can harvest shellfish from year-round. Um, they are sampled by our shellfish harvest area classification unit uh, at a minimum of six times a year. And they have proven that the uh, samples have come back clean and that they're low bacteria levels, um, so they are able to be certified. Um, the seasonally certified areas are ones that are only clean enough for part of the year. Um, most of that is in the winter. Um, there are the few um, rare occasions that we have seasonal areas that are open in the summer uh, and closed for the winter, and that's typically uh, because of seals in areas where there are a lot of seals in the winter. Um, but most of the areas are open in the winter and closed in the summer due to lower bacteria levels in the winter. Um, and then we have uncertified areas, which can be uncertified for a multitude of reasons. Um, and not all uncertified areas are equal. So they can be uncertified because we don't have the capacity to sample them. 
Uh, so that is a lot of Westchester shoreline, New York Harbor, uh, pretty much everything west of like Hempstead. Um, doesn't get sampled regularly, uh, partially because we know that there are high levels of CSOs or combined sewer overflows or sewage treatment plants that discharge into the areas. Um, so we know that there's a chance that they're already highly contaminated and we just don't have the capacity to be able to sample them regularly. Um, there are areas that are closed precautionarily. Uh, so most of those are marina areas or areas around sewage treatment plant outfalls. Um, so where the sewage treatment plants are dumping the treated sewage essentially, um, those areas are closed year round um, because there's a chance that there could be a bypass to the sewage treatment plant system. Um, and then there are uncertified areas that are uncertified because they are sampled regularly, uh, but they are, have been proven to be unclean and the, the bacteria levels are too high. So it would be unsafe for people to harvest shellfish from those areas. Great. And uh, just to clarify, too, for all of you oyster lovers out there, all the commercially raised shellfish from the aquaculture industry is raised in certified waters. So you don't have to worry about any of those potential issues. Um, Chelsea, just as a follow up, can oyster restoration be done anywhere, or is there some caveats to that regarding the certification? Uh, there's definitely some caveats to it. Uh, as I said, not all uncertified areas are equal. Um, so there are certain areas that we definitely won't allow restoration. Uh, we'll consider it uh, for maybe rib muscle restoration or potentially we're considering seaweed uh, in certain areas. Um, but these are going to be areas that are known to be highly contaminated, um, such as certain areas in New York Harbor and super, uh, super fun sites those areas we typically won't allow any kind of restoration um, but other uncertified areas we can consider uh, spat on shell oysters but we won't allow any single set um, or our hard clam restoration in uh, other uncertified areas great thank you and just as a point of clarification too spat on shell oyster are basically the clusters so like the little building blocks of reef different from the single set oyster that you're used to seeing when you go to a raw bar um and so um that's a nice segue to kind of talk about the various habitat restoration programs that our panelists have all been involved with um, because there are different styles of habitat restoration um so maybe first we'll we'll start with uh Greg, who's kind of the godfather of the uh, oyster habitat restoration on Long Island. Um, why don't you tell us about the various efforts you've worked on, including maybe general, ro general ro locations, and whether it was for building reefs, general population enhancement, or even both. Yeah, thanks, Barry. I, uh, I started a hatchery for the town of South Hold. Okay, sorry about that. I started a hatchery for the town of South Hold back in 1991 at a Suffolk County owned facility in South Hold. And we now provide seed to three towns on eastern Long Island, do a lot of research out of it. And that's more, more of a resource enhancement project or program where we put out clams, oysters, and base scallops, singles, not spat on shell, for any taxpayer in the town that has a valid permit to harvest, to harvest those down, years down as they uh, mature. Then about 2010, <coughs> The city of New York uh, asked us to get involved, my colleague and I, uh, my boss now, Chris Pickerel, to get involved with a pilot oyster reef project in Queens and Brooklyn in Jamaica Bay and also eelgrass that uh, Chris was involved in. And that was the first large scale thing I was involved in uh, going back now 14 years, I guess. And the, the Queens reef was wiped out by Superstorm Sandy. So that was a learning experience there. It was doing really well and it just got flattened. And the other thing I'll say about all of these programs is uh, shell. Getting the substrate is a big deal. Uh, we talked about Sea Tuck. They have a great shell recycling program. I do a small scale thing out where I live in Greenport with a few restaurants. Uh, we buy surf clam shell on occasion and that's what went into uh, the Jamaica Bay Reef primarily as a base to put a base down. And then I've worked all the way to Montauk with uh, small scale projects as well. Uh, with all three of these uh, nonprofits down here, say the Great South Bay, going <laughs> west to east, 
Friends of Belport Bay and the Riches Bay Project, which works in Brookhaven and Southampton. And again, getting the shell, getting the permits is, is always, I know we're not even talking about constraints yet, but I'll bring it up. It's, it's a big deal because you get funding for a project and then it takes a year or more to get an Army Corps permit to put up something that's not really even going to affect a kayaker going over it. Uh, to me, that's just, it's, it's bothersome. So. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, how about Demetrius? Why don't you talk about some of the efforts that you've been involved in? Because you, Demetrius has done a great job taking over the CARE program that I had initially started, and then la uh, our only year that we got to spend together, he really helped us launch that in conjunction with the Rotary Club. We've got some uh, supporters out there in the back. Um, but that's a very unique one. Uh, so why don't you talk about your work in Huntington and beyond? Yeah, the Oyster Care Project really had taken off in the last year um, or two, starting with a lot of community partners. Rob Kraffa was probably the original one that our team worked with in kickstarting this community aquaculture initiative. And then from there, it blossomed into Huntington and Northport Rotary Clubs, both wanting to participate and grow um, what we call nursery docks, which are suspended crates that hold spat on shell oysters. And from there, we even have other partners like yacht clubs and boating clubs, including Huntington, Northport, Centerport, and Ketuamok Yacht Club, all in the Huntington Northport Bay um, complex. And then outside of Huntington and Northport, with Andy, we extended to Bayshore and Babylon Yacht Club, where they grew oysters in crates. Um, Saville Rotary and Yacht Club teamed up to grow about 20 mil crates worth of spat on shell oysters as well um, within their dock space. And it's a really great community based initiative. We're not kicking out tremendous numbers of spat on shell oysters, but that's not necessarily the goal of a lot of these projects. The goal of a lot of these projects is to educate and give the public a platform to do this community-based restoration and water quality project. And what a lot of these yacht clubs like to do is they have junior sailing teams, they have camps that they have all throughout the year, and it's an activity for the kids to get some kind of scientific hands-on experience during the summer months. You know, taking basic shell length, measurements, counting the number of live versus dead oysters per shell. Um, it's always really exciting when you pull up a crate and a crab or an eel or some kind of fish comes flopping out of it. Uh, it gets the kids all worked up. It's always a lot of fun to see, see that happen. Um, and the best part about that project is that it gets a lot of people who don't have access to this kind of work, hands-on experience actually doing this. And then it all culminates together at the end of the year um, planting in some of our designated reef areas. We have one by our beach at Gold Star. We have another one in, Hunt in Northport Bay. And then finally with Andy and, and Saville Rotary, we teamed up and we started another reef on uh, the South Shore in Iceland. So it really works well for a lot of our partners and the reefs, which is usually the primary goal of a lot of restoration projects is almost like a secondary objective for us because it gives so many platforms and so many community-based groups an opportunity to do this work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and the one, going back to the, the certification aspect of the water bodies, the reason, the genesis for this was we had a lot of interest from community members that wanted to do community uh, oyster restoration, but they were in these uncertified water bodies. And now don't let it fool you. Just because we made it work didn't mean there weren't a lot of challenges. We, we worked closely with DEC. We had to f make sure that there were certain things that we could do to make sure that raising the spat on shell would still be safe. It would still be getting put in locations that are being monitored. Because at the end of the day, the reason behind not wanting to put oysters in uncertified water bodies is so that people aren't potentially poaching them and getting sick. Um, so. That was the reason for we started to think outside the box. How can we get community members involved in these uncertified water bodies? And using the spat on shell allowed that. And we actually found that it really lends itself to helping build um, habitat for, for the reefs. And now, Andy, you are the uh, newest newcomer to the, the spat on shell stuff. Andy reached out to me last spring and about you know their work here. And 
I had told him, I said, you know, I had this idea of this care program that Demetrius is doing. I said, I always wanted to see it expand to other locations. Um, and so we made the right connections and Andy ran with it. Why don't you tell everyone how, how that went out for you? <clears throat> well, it became a, uh, a high pressure, low key event that uh, I got really excited about the prospect of being able to work on a small scale, get the community involved, and uh, do something productive. Uh, the miracle of this is that in a short three month period of time, uh, I was able to see with my own eyes uh, the miracle of spat on shell growth. And going from a, a basically a, a single shell dotted with baby oysters in June or July to our harvest in September, now you've got this really hefty three-dimensional, what I like to call a building block of uh, future oyster, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a reef or not, but uh, a oyster restoration area. Uh, I didn't have much time because uh, w w I got wind of this sort of late, but we were able to pull it off. Uh, I borrowed a pickup truck and went up and met Demetrius and loaded up uh, the truck with, uh, I guess, eight uh, milk crates. Of course, it was like an 85 degree plus day, and I drove like a bat out of hell to get back down to the South Shore from Huntington. I immediately went down to my yacht club, the Babylon Yacht Club, and put all eight cages in the water uh, just to make sure everything would survive. And sure enough, it did. And I, I was really happy about it. Uh, we split them up between the two yacht clubs, Babylon and Bayshore. We had small groups of volunteers because this was a uh, startup project for us. I didn't want to get too far over my head. And because I was singularly responsible for both of these uh, projects, I uh, wanted to be hands-on from start to finish. And I was, and I'm glad that I did it, because it, uh, it uh, gave me the wherewithal to want to expand this tremendously. And uh, I think I've got the support of my uh, Great South Bay members, I think we have uh, stirred up a lot of support in communities around Great South Bay that have expressed an interest in uh, diving into this program. Um, as was mentioned, one big part of this is to get people involved and instruct them and, and give them a sense of uh, belonging to the improvement of you know, their local water bodies. But the other part is the real restoration side of it. And that's where we're looking to expand. I know there's a supply of unused flupsies that I would love to get my hands on, uh, provided we can find the right locations for them, uh, simply because it allows you to grow out a lot more in a much more confined space uh, and very efficiently with the uh, help of uh, some pumps to uh, circulate the water. We don't have the tidal range here that they do on the North Shore, uh, so the flupsies here would likely need to be powered somewhat, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm hoping we can get that going. Uh, this year we're expanding to a third yacht club. Uh, thank you to uh, Mayor Siri. Uh, in Amityville for giving us the opportunity and the town of Babylon for uh, letting us set up a, uh, a small uh, test area to see if uh, it's suitable for uh, further uh, growing out of spat on shell. I think we will have the Unqua Yacht Club uh, fully on board this year. Uh, we're looking to uh, bump up our production at the Babylon and uh, Bayshore Yacht Clubs to 10 crates apiece. And um, we're also uh, going to explore areas over on Fire Island to uh, see if we can uh, have a little success uh, growing out more spat on shell there. So uh, that's sort of where we are. It was a miracle year for me. 
It was great for the uh, Great South Bay Oyster Project to uh, enlighten us on uh, what really is possible and to be able to work with DEC, collaborate with Cooperative Extension to uh, be able to utilize all of this uncertified water for uh, hopefully a, uh, you know, a, a productive and uh, useful uh, outcome somewhere down the road and hopefully soon. That's great. It. Great. It's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely a great success story, and especially, yeah, because it came together kind of late in the season. Um, and that's one of the most exciting parts about these types of community restoration programs, because traditionally it was seed was being grown in a hatchery. It might have been raised on the docks, and then it was just deployed. But this gave an opportunity to get community members involved, um, especially because it, it conveniently grows just enough during the summer months that you can put it out so you get lots of kids involved um, and that's really been the the big popular boost on this is that it really gets so many community members involved and aware of something that traditionally was kind of a hands-off opportunity um, so kind of building on that oh that Andy before you go too crazy expanding make sure you talk to Rob Craffa who, who leads the Oyster Bay and James Wiley um, as both of them have expanded and uh, just make sure you know what you're in for um, and for any of you that's interested and excited about trying to do these things make sure you give yourselves be talking about this in the before Christmas so that there's time to be talking permits and making sure DEC is on board and you can do things. You don't want to rush into it. You know, we kind of, we helped Andy expedite things pretty quickly because I had done it before. Uh, so I knew how to shortcut the line, but I don't recommend that to everyone. Wade and, Wade and Chelsea will get mad at us. Um, but so talking about uh, community engagement, um, many of your efforts include community members in, in various ways. Um, and it's a great way to increase community education and awareness about habitat restoration and its, and its benefits the environmental benefits. Um, do you see a way to expand this educational opportunity to be more inclusive about the public's ability to reduce our anthropogenic impacts on, on water bodies? Um, specifically, I'm thinking, what about what peop educating people about what they put on their lawns, how that runs into the bays, and also maybe trying to encourage native terrestrial planting, plantings to those that live along the water. Do you see a way that you could go beyond just about the oyster habitat restoration, is there a way to incorporate that into some of um, the, these uh, opportunities that you've been doing? Um, maybe we'll, Greg, we'll start with you. Well, I would say, uh, say the Great South Bay has been doing that already, uh, more than pretty much any other of these, uh, I guess I can call them ENGOs on, on the South Shore here. So just uh, pair the fun stuff with putting oysters out, with the harder stuff, like not as much fertilizer. Long Island Sound study, probably decades ago now, had these great posters of a guy in like Bermuda shorts with black knee-high socks uh, on the thin amount of water with his uh, fertilizer, like he's in Long Island Sound, or washing his car with all the suds going into the sound. It was, it was pretty powerful posters. So things like that, I think, are, uh, are what we want to see. Yeah. Andy, do you have anything you could think of that would maybe things that you're already doing beyond just the oysters? Uh, part of our program is uh, with the Creek Defenders and the native planting, uh, we really like to engage the community on land. Uh, this oyster restoration is uh, a little more attuned to living on Long Island for those of us that are immersed in the marine world. But uh, terrestrially, we've had success working with scout groups, uh, getting them involved. I uh, sponsored an Eagle Scout a couple of years ago, and uh, he wound up doing a native planting at a local church. I mean, there's a lot of these opportunities out there that, um, that we hope to continue to take advantage of. Demetrius, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that the biggest connection to draw for, the, for everybody on Long Island, from whether you're sitting at this panel or you're walking down Main Street and you've never heard of an oyster, is anything we do on land 
especially here on Long Island, eventually makes its way into our waters. You know, we have such a beautiful environment on both North and South Shore, but, you know, like you said, anything we put on our lawns and excess that isn't taken up by the lawn eventually makes its way into the sound. Um, you know, cesspool in infiltration into the waters is another really big issue that is another lead cause of excess nutrients in the water. So learning how our daily activities are impacting our natural environment and then looking for ways that can kind of augment those issues that we're unaware that we're causing. Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, yes, sorry, Chelsea. <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, one thing I just want to emphasize is that putting shellfish into the water and uh, building these oyster reefs and stuff is great, and it will contribute to cleaning up the bays and stuff, but the, the bigger problem is this, the initial pollution going into the water. Uh, you know, it's like trying to use the oysters to clean up the bay on their own. Like, it is a very small piece of the puzzle. And uh, getting the pollution, getting less pollution into the water in the first place should really be a big first step as opposed to just putting oysters into the water and cleaning it up after the fact. That's true. That's a very good point. We, many times when we were doing projects, people would be like, how many oysters do we need to put in the water before it would clean the bay? And if... And if it were a fishbowl, you could calculate that number. But being that there's the constant input, that's not really the answer. It's a good place to start, but it is not the, not the sole solution. Um, do you guys have some guidance for enlisting new partners or new communities to help with restoration efforts, specifically maybe with the spat on shell? Um, and you could even think about, Greg mentioned, getting shell is, is, is kind of a limiting factor. So. Um, maybe Demetrius, we'll start with you. What, what do you thought? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think drawing awareness to how difficult it is to get shell for some of these restoration projects now is a great first step into enlisting. You know, you go to restaurants or whatever, and you try and tell them, "Hey, we we need to do a shellfish restoration project. We need shell. Would be able to do a shell recycling program with you guys." And then the more restaurants you get involved, it does create more legwork because when oyster shells sit in a bucket for a few days they do not smell great i'll tell you i'll tell you that in restaurants the last thing they want is a bucket full of shells in their kitchen stinking up their restaurant and then causing other issues with other entities that are way above where we're working here um you know getting the community involved in these projects it doesn't have to be just coming down to the docks. You know, there's a lot of like work that needs to be done into planning these types of projects. So the more work you can get from shell recycling to education to working on the docks, you know, that's the benefit of that. And then highlighting the importance of focusing on what kind of restoration effort they want to do that might suit their needs. You know, are they looking for a restoration? Or are they looking for an enhancement prog program? Those are the kinds of things that you want to really push for your volunteers to think about before you start these projects. Andy, do you have any ideas? No, I have none. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, how about yourself? I was just thinking about the Jamaica Bay project where this is in an area of pretty low income folks in Queens, especially where there's a subsistence fishery where people are crabbing and fishing to bring home to eat. Uh, and we basically try to keep things quiet, the opposite of here. Uh, that's one case. But, I mean, if we go to uh, a project I worked in in East uh, Mariches where we had neighbors that were right, waterfront homes right off the, the reef that kept an eye on things would call us and also call, you know, DEC or the Brookhaven uh, constables if they saw anything untoward there. And that was in a certified area. And there was a little bit of poaching because there's some really nice oysters there. But uh, she put a stop to that. It was, it was, that, was, to me, was great. Money's great, too, of course. And uh, I'll say something now. I often think of a lot of our projects as the time I got an uh, ant farm for my birthday as a kid. And I, the ants was cool. It was fun. And then I kind of lost interest. Like the funding dried up, and all my ants died. And that's how I see a lot of these projects. So getting people, you need new people, you need funding. Uh, whether that's taxpayer dollars uh, or contributions, uh, tax, you know, tax exempt contributions. So, cool. 
Thank you, Greg. Um, so let's talk about ways to improve uh, oyster habitat restoration. One of the challenging aspects of this field is that not everything always goes to plan. Just because something worked one day doesn't mean it will tomorrow, or even in one location. Um, and it doesn't necessarily, what works somewhere does, won't work everywhere. Um, many of you were involved with the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project in various ways. That was probably one of the largest coordinated efforts for shellfish restoration on Long Island, but as well as your other programs that you've been involved with over the years. Um, let's, are there some lessons that have been learned from those projects um, that could possibly be used and applied here in Great South Bay um, for ongoing efforts, or anywhere for that matter? But Greg, I want to start with you. I mean, site selection is important. Uh, sometimes we pick a site for convenience. We don't want to use a boat to get there. We want to be able to walk in in a, in a bathing suit or a wetsuit or waders. But those shallow areas in a, in a storm with a fetch miles away, you just it could be wiped out in just one night, one day. Uh, also, we did some intertidal work years ago in Bellport Bay by the new inlet that was opened up with uh, Sandy. <clears throat> and we go out to the site in March, and all these dead oysters are there. And what the heck, is this disease? Because it was winter, you didn't expect disease uh, to hit that hard in winter. Then I saw clams that were wild clams also, out of their burrows, the shell, you know, the, the shells are still attached. And we realized that it was uh, anchor frost. Uh, it had gotten so cold one night at low tide, I mean, probably minus five or 10 that winter. It just takes one night at low tide, and it killed 90 plus percent of our oysters. So keep that in mind. I mean, again, it was, it were, it were, they did great until that one night. And everybody's, you know, we're all getting warming oceans, but those nights are still ahead of us, I think. Yeah, site selection is big, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't predict. You think it's good. It looks good. <laughs> and then, uh, Andy. Uh, I'll, I'll jump on that one. When we, uh, or I came into this project, uh, we had done one planting and semi-established a sanctuary site in the town of Islip, uh, which at the time wasn't properly permitted, but is now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my hands-on experience was uh, pretty devastating because our methodology at the time was to buy spat on shell from Cornell Cooperative Extension out in South Holt and free plant it uh, because that's what we were permitted to do. Well, free planting shells didn't work out too well. Uh, I'll put it that way. After two years of planting, we went and uh, Greg and I did an extensive uh, search of a really large area around where we planted, and we didn't find anything. We found not a single survivor of the shells, the spat on shell that we had planted a year and two years earlier. That enough was enough lesson for me that, uh, hmm, this is a waste of money. We can't keep doing this. Uh, although we did do it with the Nature Conservancy last year, but those were sort of pre-selected sites that uh, hopefully will retain some of the clams, uh, some of the oysters we planted there. Uh, the point being though, once again, the emphasis for us to do restoration work is to be able to get that seasoned spat on shell is just, you know, that stuff is a miracle for me. I will, I will endeavor to continue to uh, raise that as long as I can and as well as I can. Cornell's Hatchery thanks you. <laughs> uh, Chelsea, from a regulatory perspective, do you have any lessons learned, you think, from all the projects? Yeah, um, I, I feel like one of the biggest things um, is just communication and collaboration between groups and people, which there's a little bit of now, and it seems like that's starting to expand more. Um, but there's, I've seen a lot of little smaller projects um, starting up, and it'll be nice to see all of those groups kind of working together more and collaborating um, and just helping expand those projects. And um, to kind of emphasize what they were saying about site location, I feel like uh, post-monitor, pre-monitoring and post-monitoring of 
sites are is very, very important, um, you know, pre-monitoring to know that if the site's going to be suitable for oysters uh, to not only live, but for them to thrive and to recruit and uh, to continue to grow and it become a sustainable population on its own. And then post monitoring to know if it's actually happening or not. Great. Demetrius, how about you? Yeah, just to kind of piggyback on that one, working on the Long Island Shellfish Restoration Project, that was my first hands on experience actually planting shellfish. And the spat on shell deployment method was, you know, you'd go on a boat and you'd kind of go back and forth over a large area and you're dumping the trays of the shell off the side of the boat. And then when you're going back to monitor that, you're doing quadrat sampling and it's, you know, it's a little, it's sparse. You know, not the entire bottom is covered in the oysters and you might find five in this quadrat, three in this quadrat, and then like 20 in another quadrat, depending on how the shells fall. This past year when I planted the, all the oyster care oysters, I took the method that we did the previous year where I dove down and actually built the reef by hand to kind of achieve a really dense population of oysters in a relatively small area, um, not exceeding the foot and a half, by the way. <laughs> but um, I found that that almost, we, we started calling it critical mass or critical density, really held the reef intact. You know, every time I dive down there, it might have a little bit of sediment accretion, but the oysters are still all alive. Um, this past year, we had um, a team from NOAA actually come and do disease monitoring on our reef. And as an aside, for me, they did uh, recruitment monitoring. And the reef at Gold Star did show signs of recruitment. You know, they were finding all different size, size classes, which that's almost the key word, as Chelsea mentioned. Recruitment is really important. As much as I love doing this work, I don't want to dive down and plant oysters every year for the rest of my life and then my kids do it for the rest of their life just to keep that reef alive. You know, at some point, Mother Nature needs to be able to take the reins and say, all right, you built the initial structure. Now we're able to seed it with larvae. And that's the biggest benefit of that high density as well as when those, when those oyster reefs spawn, they... It's a super high density. All those oysters are near each other. It's a much better increase of fertilization coming out of there. Um, and whether or not that reef is self-seeding itself or if they're coming from other locations within Huntington or Northport Bay, we don't know. That would be pretty difficult to prove exactly where those recruits came from. But I would say having that solid, eventual solid structure as the oysters grow into each other um, it makes them more resistant to storms. We're also in a pretty nice area where we can get some pretty gnarly fetch if the wind's coming out of the north. And it survived one winter of storms that rolled through. So it's a pretty good indicator. I'm excited to get down there after this year and see how they did again. Um, and yeah, I would say taking a little bit more time to build those compactly. I use those orange fish totes again. Um, and it does involve a lot of manual labor. I swam up and down 70-something times each time I did it. You know, it was a lot of work. I slept really well for the next couple of days after that. Um, but the results kind of speak for themselves from, from what I've seen so far. And I'm really excited to see how that continues to grow. That's great. That's great, Dan. Yeah. Yeah, just a couple things along those lines, uh, Demetrius. In Bellport Bay, with the Friends of Bellport Bay last summer, we had 10 SPAC collectors out. These are just... Uh, kind of floating bags off the bottom on a concrete block with about 10 shells, oyster shells in each one that we would use in our set tanks as culch. And we found two oysters set on those shells and it's the first time in putting hundreds of these things out from Jamaica Bay out to Montauk that we f I found anything like that. And again, can't prove it's from their two acre reef there, but it's a really good sign. And keep in mind that these larvae are floating around for weeks and they're planktonic. So they could wind up miles away. But by creating a constellation of reefs, maybe in, in Great South Bay, Northport Harbor, uh, out, out east, I think you can get uh, you know, back and forth between these, these populations. I also wanted to, talking about the future, I also wanted to give a shout out to commercial shellfish farmers because number one, they're creating habitat. They're removing a lot of nitrogen from the bays uh, at little to no cost to the taxpayer. 
Uh, and that comes from someone who's most of my salary is from taxpayers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I've worked with these guys for 30, 37 years now. They also were involved years ago <clears throat> with some Pew and Nature Conservancy monies selling these, these big ugly <clears throat> oysters that were a result of the of COVID pandemic, where they, the oysters continued to grow, they didn't have markets. So what do you do with these big gnarly oysters? Well, you could shuck them, you could put them on a barbecue, but it's not the same as a, a half shell, a cocktail oyster. So we were involved with receiving these oysters, checking them, cleaning them, holding them until they were put out in places like Shinnecock Bay and Oyster Bay. And I want, I'd like to see more of that, even though COVID's passed, there are still, sometimes you get some big oysters or oysters that don't really look great on a plate. Uh, also using these folks that have boats and knowledge to uh, work with us to transport stuff out, maybe grow some, some oysters out, whether that's spot on shell or singles. So thanks. thanks yeah, guys. that's a really good point. One, one last piece of that? I know we want yes. to move on. But another great, that's a really great point about the commercial farmers. One last thing you mentioned, uh, I think the term we could use to do this, like a meta population where reefs are communicating each other with larvae. An oyster growers farm is a source of a meta population if those oysters do live or grow long enough to spawn. You know, that is a source of planktonic larvae. Yeah, Back to me. <laughs> we talked about site selection. We're talking about mega meta populations, cross communication between different populations. You, I'm sure you can't see this very well. What it is is a map of the Long Island shellfish restoration project, their various sites. And what I can explain to you that you probably can't see is that there's a site on eastern Long Island, there's a couple of sites on the western, extreme western part of Great South Bay, and nothing in between. I queried about that because I did sit on one of the uh, restoration committees. And uh, the explanation was that the water quality in the middle part, the major part of the bay, was uh, insufficient to uh, support a project of oyster reef restoration. So what uh, all that did was light the fire under me a little bit higher. And uh, so we're sort of filling in the blanks here. We have one sanctuary, a second one under, uh, under, underway in uh, Amityville, uh, a third one potentially we're looking at uh, in the Nature Conservancy property. And if you dot all those in there, we have built a chain of sanctuaries across the North Shore of Great South Bay. And uh, hopefully we will uh, see some contribution uh, over the years ahead to uh, the overall uh, fertility of the bay. We'll, we'll hopefully see cross, you know, fertilization and recruitment at these uh, various sites. I will note that the islip farms right now uh, have anecdotally, and, and we have farmers here that will uh, attest to this, but we are starting to find uh, uh, scallops spawning um, we have found oysters setting more towards the inlet than inside the bay, uh, which makes sense because that's where the farm is. The farms are all fairly close to the inlet. But uh, it speaks well. Islip uh, has an ambitious program to open more farming off of Hexer Park, which is square in the middle of the bay, and that should really, uh, over time, be uh, quite telling in... Uh, making a difference in the water quality, especially if uh, all the farmers jump on board and it becomes a real productive area. Uh, what I have found to my own satisfaction is, yeah, even in this uncertified, uh, unsuitable water, we're able to grow spat on shell. So to that, to me, that's gold. That's great. Thank you, Andy. Um, just to make sure we've got some time for questions, we're going to touch on one last point. I just want maybe you guys can all keep it real short. Um, there's been a lot of strong effort from the state, Suffolk County, and numerous towns around Long Island uh, at expanding shellfish habitat. It's been done in a variety of ways, even including the ability for towns um, opening up private shellfish farmers to lease sites. Um, thank you, Demetrius, for covering that point. That's what I was going to make. Um, the towns of Brookhaven, Islip, and Babylon have 
ongoing programs to expand shellfish habitat within the Great South Bay as well, including these lease sites. Um, are there any recommendations that you guys would want to share to town, county, or state officials about things they could do to increase shellfish habitat and populations within the Great South Bay. Chelsea, we'll leave you off the hook for this one, being a state <laughs> DEC employee. But Greg, maybe if you could try to keep it short. I would say uh, permitting is, is an issue for me, especially if you're putting substrate down. And with the lack of shell, we're going to things like reef balls and these oyster castles that are made out of concrete. And that's great. Uh, Gabions is another thing where now we can protect the shoreline better than just putting some shell down uh, that might get wiped out in a big storm. So to me, permitting is a big deal. And also continued funding, these town hatcheries that were started largely in the 80s and early 90s, keep that, that funding going. And I, again, I know taxpayer dollars are precious, but keep the amp farm going. <laughs> Andy, any? I pass. Demetrius, do you have any <laughs> recommendations? I had, well, one thing that Chelsea mentioned, working on that, those guidelines for the shellfish restoration going forward, I think is going to be immensely helpful. Um, just trying to, just eliminating a lot of the questions that, you know, volunteers or towns or even ourselves might have about what is a good site for, what is a good candidate for a restoration site? What isn't a good candidate and why? Um, having a map to refer to is going to make a big difference in our planning going forward. Great. And then of course, money always helps. <laughs> Well, thank you. I think we've learned a lot today, and this is a perfect example of why we do these speaker series, because it is so important that every voice be heard, and that every voice out on the bay be represented at the table. Um, there, there is very clean water at the inlet. There's no question about that, but there are pollution problems in the bay as you get closer to the mainland. So thank you, for everybody, for your input. That is, uh, it is really important. I would just like to take uh, three minutes more of your time and uh, have Rihanna Quinrati come up to the mic. And then I would like to invite any public officials before we break up to come up for a photo opportunity. I know from Kevin McCaffrey, he said, if you don't get the photo, it doesn't count. So, so um, please join us. And before anybody approaches the speakers, they'll, they'll stick around for a few minutes to speak with you individually. But uh, just allow us to do that one photo opportunity. Thank you. Here you go, Rihanna. Thank you, Robin. Um, good morning again, everybody. I think we're all in this room because we love not only our Great South Bay, but other bodies of waters. Um, and we love the fact that I've been told, I don't know if it's lore or, 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 or truth, that a mature oyster can, can filter 50 gallons of water a day. We, is that truth? <laughs> Um, so we are, we are oyster lovers as well, uh, as the fact that they taste great and they are wonderful. You know, we are all uh, at Save the Great South Bay. I joined this board because they Save the Great South Bay is an organization of doers. They get things done. They'll define a project. They'll strategize on the pro project. They'll develop um, performance indicators, and they will execute a project. And um, I'm so excited to be on this board because we have so many wonderful projects coming up. But as Greg said and others said today, it takes money. It takes money to execute the programs that we, um, that we are undertaking and those that we aspire to have in the future. I don't know about you, but I am a very, very impatient Irish woman. <laughs> and I would love the Great South Bay and our other bodies, our other estuaries to be clean uh, for our children but I'd like to see change in our lifetime. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and in doing so, um, Todd has uh, for many years talked about having an event uh, for Save the Great South Bay so that we can actually communicate um, issues that Chris was talking about. We can communicate the problems of the bay. We can communicate that areas of our bays are, are crystal clear. We can communicate to our, 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 our volunteers, our, our uh, communities, our elected officials, um, that we have programs that are making a difference for the Great South Bay. And I know it's a little bit premature because this is really not baked fully, but I would like to announce to all these oyster lovers in the room that this autumn we will be holding our first oyster ball. And it'll raise money to do more of the great programs that we're doing. And you'll hear more about this in the coming months. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs>